In this video, I will be going through five cases for the calculation of basic earnings per share and diluted earnings per share. Now, for case one, we will look at a hypothetical company called Blue Gates, and we will only calculate the basic earnings per share. And then for the next four cases, we are going to look at the calculation of diluted earnings per share. Now, for case one, the net income of Blue Gates is $1.5 million. Blue Gates has 25,000 preferred shares outstanding, each with a par value of $100. The preferred dividend rate is 8%. Preferred dividends is left blank here, so we'll have to calculate this uh, shortly. The weighted average number of common shares outstanding is 400,000 at the beginning of the physical year. So we'll calculate the basic earnings per share using the formula net income minus preferred dividends divided by the weighted average number of shares outstanding. So the preferred dividends here would be based on the par value of the preferred shares. So there is 25,000 preferred shares and each has a par value of $100. So if you take 25,000 times $100, that's $2.5 million. Okay, so this is the total par value of the preferred shares. And the preferred dividends would be based on the par value multiplied by the preferred dividend rate, 8%. So that would be $200,000 of preferred dividends. So we we'll then do our calculation. The net income is uh, $1.5 million. So we have $1.5 million here. Okay, minus uh, 200000 and then we divide by 400,000. Okay, so that's 1.3 million divided by 400,000 shares. So that gives us $3.25. In case two, for the same hypothetical company, let's now assume that the preferred shares that we mentioned earlier is were actually convertible preferred shares. Uh, they were, uh, there are 25,000 of them and the par value is $100 per share. And each preferred share is convertible into four common shares. So in the case where all the preferred shares uh, were converted, we are assuming that if it's converted, then uh, we will get 25,000 multiplied by four. So that can be that will be 100,000 common shares. Okay, so if the convertible preferred shares were converted, that's, what, that's our assumption, then it will be converted into 100,000 common shares. So the details are the same as before, and we have the basic EPS from case one, which is $3.25. So now we'll calculate the diluted EPS. So what we'll do here is that if the, con if the preferred shares were converted into common shares, then there would be no need to actually pay the preferred dividends for the year. So here in the formula, we will take net income then uh, from the previous formula where we calculated the basic EPS, we would minus preferred dividends. But now that we assume that the preferred shares were converted to common shares, therefore we don't have to pay the preferred dividends anymore. So we will add back preferred dividends, which effectively cancels out these two terms. So that leaves us with just the net income in the numerator. Okay, but for understanding purposes, I have, of course, uh, shown the formula in the full form. So in your workings, you can choose to just leave preferred dividends as zero because these two will net out, leaving you with just the net income. Okay, and in the denominator, besides the weighted average number of shares outstanding, we will also add the new common shares issued at the conversion of the preferred shares. Okay, again, this is assuming that the preferred shares were converted. Okay, so let's just do the calculation. So there will be $1.5 million in net income. Uh, again, we minus the preferred dividends, okay, if you follow the formula, and then we just add back the preferred dividends, okay, again, if you do not want to do this, okay, you can choose not to because it will cancel out, and then uh, we divide by the weighted average number of shares outstanding, that's 400,000, 
and then we add in the 100,000 that we calculated from this part here. So that's 500,000. Okay, so if you have uh, here $1.5 million in the numerator and 500,000 shares in the denominator, so that will give you $3 per share. Notice that the diluted EPS is less than the basic EPS, which shows the dilutive nature of the convertible preferred shares. In case 3, we will now assume that Blue Gets has convertible debt outstanding. Okay, and there is no longer any convertible preferred shares. It's just a plain vanilla preferred shares where the preferred dividends of $200,000. Now for the convertible debt, there is an amount of $1 million of 6% convertible bonds and the bonds are convertible into 25,000 common shares. The tax rate is 30% for the company. Okay, again, we have the same details, 400,000 weighted average number of shares outstanding and the basic EPS is $3.25. So we'll calculate the diluted earnings per share for, for this convertible debt. Now, for the formula, we will, in the num uh, numerator, we have net income minus preferred dividends and plus after-tax interest expense. Okay, and this is to reverse out the interest from the convertible debt in the case where the debt is converted into common shares then no interest has to be paid okay and in the denominator we will add in the new common shares issued at the conversion of the convertible debt so let's do a few calculations here the for the after tax interest expense we will take the par amount of the bonds okay multiply to the coupon rate here six percent so that gives us the interest expense so if you take uh, one million okay so if i were to take one million okay then we will take uh, multiply by six percent and then we multiply by one minus 0 0.3 0 0.3 here is the tax rate okay thirty percent so one million times uh, six percent that will be sixty thousand this is the pre-tax interest expense okay this is uh, a a full amount and then this is uh, 1 minus 0 0.3 which is 0 0.7 so 0 0.7 times 60,000 that will be 42,000 okay so that's the after tax interest expense so to complete the calculation the net income would be 1.5 million dollars minus the preferred dividends of 200,000 then we add back the after tax interest expense which is 42,000 and then we divide by 400,000 and then we add in the 25,000 which is the number of common shares okay that you the new shares that will be issued when the bonds are converted okay into shares so uh, if you calculate this we will have uh, 1.5 million minus 200,000 plus 42,000 so that's uh, for the numerator, that's 1.342 million. For the denominator, we have 425,000. So that's about uh, 3.1576. Uh, I will round this to two decimal places. So that's $3.16. Okay, so that's $3.16. Okay, and that is less than the basic EPS that we have earlier. Right, so this is still lower than the basic EPS. So that shows that the convertible debt is dilutive. Now, some may be wondering why do we add back the after-tax interest expense from the convertible debt? Why don't we just add back the interest expense itself? Why do we need to incorporate the after-tax element? Now, to explain this part, let me just sh uh, show the derivation. So I will take the net income. Okay, I'll just take the net income and the after-tax interest expense portion. Uh, preferred dividends, we'll just leave it aside. Okay, it's not important here. So let me just clear some space. So if you look at net income, which I will represent as NI. Okay, so how do we get net income in the first place? So to get net income, we will have to take the earnings before interest and tax then we will minus the interest expense which i will show as int 
So in this case, our INT is uh, $60,000. All right. And then once you take the earnings, bef the EBIT minus interest expense, this is our EBT, which is the earnings before taxes. Okay. And then we will multiply by one minus the tax rate. So that gives us the uh, net, net income. Okay. Now, if I expand the formula, the, we will have EBIT. Okay. We will have EBIT times EBIT times one minus tax rate. Okay, and then minus interest, and then multiply by one minus tax rate. So, in this case, if the convertible debt were is converted into common shares, we don't have to pay the interest anymore. So, how do we reverse? How do I reverse this term out? So, if you want to reverse this term out, then you will have to add back. Okay, that therefore we will have to add back the after tax interest expense. All right, which is why in the second term, in the uh, final term in the formula, we have to add back the after tax interest expense so that the two terms here will then offset. So it's as if the interest was not paid in the very first place. Okay, so that explains why we don't add the interest only. We have to add back the interest after tax. Okay, so that is just to help you understand uh, why the formula works that way. Because a lot of people think that you should just add back interest. We shouldn't have that uh, 1 minus T or tax rate component. Now for the case with convertible debt, I'm going to make some changes to the assumptions. This time for the convertible bonds, the 1 million par of convertible bonds can only be converted into 10,000 common shares instead of the 25,000 common shares that we used in the previous case. Okay, so now we are just going to reduce it to 10,000 common shares. Everything else is the same. All right, so if I were to calculate again, the net income would be 1.5 million minus the preferred dividends of 200,000. The after-tax interest expense we calculated previously is 42,000. Okay, for the denominator, we would have 400,000. And then this time we'll add in only 10,000 instead of 25,000. So with that, let us see the result. So if you have 1.5 million minus 200,000 plus 42,000, so that's 1.342 million. And then we divide by 410,000 shares. So that will be $3.27. So that gives us 3.27. Now, notice that the diluted EPS that we get here is actually greater than the basic EPS of 325. Now, it doesn't work that way because the name diluted EPS here means that we have to show the dilutive nature of the security. So we can't show that the diluted EPS is higher than the basic EPS. So in this case, when the diluted EPS number or calculation is higher that means that in this case the convertible debt is what we call anti-dilutive okay it doesn't dilute it actually gives an opposite effect so what we do in this case is that we will set the diluted eps to be equals to the basic eps so your final answer here would be to set this as three dollars and 25 cents so the basic EPS here acts as a ceiling. For our last case, we will look at stock options or what we call warrants. So this time for Blue Gates, let's assume that at the beginning of their physical year, they have 60,000 options, stock options or warrants, where the exercise price is $30 and the average market price is $50 over the physical year. Okay, so they are measuring from the beginning to the end of the year. So that's over one year. Now, this time we'll calculate the diluted earnings per share and for the options, we will use the treasury stock method. So to explain a bit on this, the treasury stock method is a name given under the US GAAP. Uh, IFRS also uses a similar method, but IFRS doesn't use the name treasury stock method. Okay, but the steps, uh, the procedures are about the same. Now, what is this method about? So, 
In the case where the average market price, take note that we don't use current market price, okay, we don't use the ending market price, we use the average market price over the physical, yeah, over the period. Now, if the average market price is greater than the exercise price, then the option is in the money. Okay, which is the case here where the average market price is $50 is greater than the exercise price of $30. So think of it just like, a, it's just like a call option. Okay, the call option is in the money if the price of the underlying asset is greater than the exercise price. Right? Now, based going back to the method, so since the option is in the money, then we will assume that the option holders Okay, we'll exercise the options to buy the shares at $30. So for the option holders, they will only pay $30 a share. So since they have 60,000 options, and we will here we will assume that uh, one option can be uh, converted into one share, one common share. So for 60,000 options, then the option holders will then have to pay 60,000 times uh, $30. Okay, so that will be 1.8 million. Okay, so that will be uh, 1.8 million dollars in proceeds. Okay, so the option holders will pay 1.8 million dollars, and in return, the company Blue Gates will have to issue 60,000 new shares. Now, of course, it doesn't stop there. We will then assume the method then assumes that the company will use the proceeds, okay, they will use the proceeds from the exercise of the options to buy back some of the shares. But when the company uses the proceeds to buy back some of the existing shares, they will have to purchase it at the average market price. Now, if the company were to purchase the shares back at the market price using $1.8 million, how many shares can they buy back? So if you take 1.8 million, divide by $50 a share, that would be 36,000 shares. All right, so in this case, the company will buy back, okay, they will buy back 36,000 shares. So net, Blue Gates will only have to issue net 24,000 new shares. So the dilutive effect is not as great as just issuing the 60,000 shares alone. So now they are just issuing 24,000 new shares if we factor in the buyback. So there we go. We can now fill in the blanks. So for the formula, we will just have net income minus preferred dividends for the numerator. So that's 1.5 million minus the preferred dividends of 200,000. And then we will divide by 400,000. And then plus, so here in the uh, in the denominator, the additional amount that we have to add in here is actually the 24,000. Okay, so the net amount here is 24,000. And since the share, the options were, is already outstanding at the beginning of the physical year. Okay, or is outstanding for the entire year. So the proportion of year during which the options were outstanding is actually equals to one, okay, for the whole year. So you can just put this as one. So then we have 1.5 million minus 200,000 over 424,000. So if you calculate that, that's 1.3 million divided by 424,000. So that gives us 3.07. So definitely the diluted EPS will be lower than the basic EPS, okay? Because, uh, I mean, there's nothing added back in the uh, numerator. We only add the amount to the denominator. So definitely the diluted EPS will be lower than the basic EPS. So there it is, okay? We have gone through the basic EPS calculation, okay? We have gone through uh, three cases of dilutive securities. We have the convertible preferred shares, uh, we have the convertible debt, and we also have stock options or what we call warrants. Okay, so be careful when you calculate the diluted EPS, it's always best to compare it back to the basic EPS, especially for convertible debt, 
as we saw earlier, in some cases, the diluted APS can be greater than the basic APS. In those kind of cases, remember to set the diluted APS equals to the basic APS. So that's the end of the video.